Uh, my name is Neil McKenzie. I'm the Universal Furniture. Um, as you do pop on, I'll let you know that we are recording uh, this session and all the sessions that we've been um, executing, both virtual, and we've only had two uh, limited uh, attendance, uh, small affairs, if you will, uh, inside our uh, inside our space. Uh, but I'm in the Learning Center uh, all by myself, um, and um, it's been a, a unique uh, market experience, but uh, I think everyone has done um, a good job to, I think, be safe and uh, you know make sure that people can uh, do what they need to do. And um, uh, it's been a unique week uh, to say the <laughs> least though. So um, I wanted to, uh, before I introduce uh, Caitlin, I just wanted to um, thank you all for participating in this. We have a number of events uh, throughout the week, um, both again, mostly virtual this go around, but you do have the opportunity if you uh, have not to uh, go to our uh, market events page and you can register for any of the upcoming events. Uh, we do record them all. So if you can't take it in in person, um, we'll record it and send it out to you. And then we are going to be hosting a virtual market session. So if you weren't able to uh, come down to High Point for obvious reasons, uh, we'll have some content uh, to allow you to hopefully bring what we've done here, uh, including a new introduction into outdoor uh, with Coastal Living Outdoor, just over 100 SKUs. We have a new work from home program, which um, uh, those two things are trending well uh, right now. So um, we have a lot of that content and more uh, to bring to you virtually on November 16th and 17th. So uh, now I'm going to kick it over to Caitlin Peterson. Caitlin, of course, is the editor-in-chief of Business of Home. Uh, they have, a, I think, a tremendous unique voice here in the industry and one that we certainly uh, look to and respect um, in really kind of giving you a good perspective of a lot of things that are happening in the world of interior design. So Caitlin, welcome, and I'll let you uh, take over. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, and it's so great to see all of you here. Thanks for joining us. Um, I am thrilled to be joined today by two amazing interior designers, Ariane Belazare of Ariane Belazare Interiors in Louisiana, and Amy Mitchell of Home Glow Design in New Hampshire. Um, and I met them both as part of our 50 States project this year. Um, and one of the things that really struck me about both of them is how thoughtfully they have built their businesses around the right client for their firm. Um, and to me, so much of that comes down to really knowing what value you bring and then finding the client that matches with that value. And so that's what we're gonna talk about today. I'm really excited about it. Um, before we start, just a huge thank you to Universal for bringing us all together today. Um, and I know we've all gotten really good at Zoom these days, but just remember, I'm keeping an eye on the chat. On the chat, So if you've got a question, chime in. We'll fold that into the conversation. We definitely want to hear from you. Let's dive in. First of all, welcome to both of you. It's Thank great you. to see you Thank both you. here. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. I want to set the stage a little bit, because like I said, you guys have both done such a tremendous job of identifying that ideal client and really crafting your messaging to resonate with that person. And I was hoping each of you could describe the journey of sort of how you landed where you are today in terms of what you offer who and who you want to work with. Um, I know, Ariane, let's start with you. Your site opens with the line, build, renovate, or decorate with confidence. And you also use the line, um, save time, save money, save your marriage. <laughs> <laughs> how, how, how did that come to be? How did you realize that that was the messaging that you needed to attract the people you wanted to work with? Well, I think um, it's two parts. The first part was working in the industry and going through those phases that we all have where we are working for everybody and doing everything <laughs> and starting to, and then slowly starting to pay attention to what our sweet spots are, what our zones of genius are, what things bring us joy, what makes what things make us happy, what parts of the job bring us angst, what type of clients bring us angst. So it's, you know, kind of that part of the journey, but then also um, my background is in communications. So um, I have a, a bachelor's degree in PR and a master's in political communication. So I've always kind of had that hat of how to communicate and understanding the power of words and messaging, understanding how to make someone or regurgitate to them what they are thinking or what they've said. And I think that has served me well in my business, not only in how I market my business, but also how I take my client through the process and communicate to them what's gonna happen because expectation is so important. So I would say it was twofold. It was always wearing that communication hat, but then also 
you know, getting through those phases where I then had the confidence and the space to be able to say, I don't have to do every project for everyone. And if I've got to do a project, what are the ones that I really want to spend time or pour my energy into? Which ones will bring me fulfillment and also give me an opportunity to really knock it out of the park for my clients? Yeah. Um, the messaging piece came from just kind of a consistent note that my clients were constantly saying, and it took me a while to realize they all had, or all my ideal clients all had that common thread. Mm -hmm. So they all said things like, I just, I'm so anxious and I don't feel like I have the confidence to make the right choice. I'm really nervous that I'm gonna make a mistake. So they would say things like that all the time when they when I would do the onboarding interview and say, well, why are you hiring a designer and what can we do to help you? And understanding that for them, the biggest piece was lacking confidence mm -hmm. was how I knew to make that the number one line on my website. Mm -hmm. It's if you are someone who, if you are someone who is very confident in your position, then that's going to turn you off and that's okay with me, right? <laughs> I don't want to work with you if you say, I know what I want. I just want you to be the girl, you know, the girl Friday to do it. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. I want you to come to me if you need help understanding why certain decisions are the right ones so that we can get you to the point of confidence. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Number two, I realized that most of my projects that I loved were uh, families or partners who came to me almost wanting me to wear the hat of marriage counselor as well and you know <laughs> being the mediator and yeah. so that is why my line says you know save i save you time i save you money and i save your marriage because i can help you communicate better around the expectations of, of this process and i cannot tell you how many clients have told me when they hired me it was the website and it was that line that told them i was the girl for them because they were in the middle of a fight about, you know, <laughs> what to do with the flooring mm -hmm. or the paint. Um, and just having someone say and acknowledge that that is a part of the process and that is a part of what makes it so difficult is that, you know, tension in a marriage that breaks the ice and lets you kind of have those conversations and again, set the expectation. That's amazing. How long did it take you to kind of pick up on those trends or to realize, oh, the, the people I love working with the most and the projects I love the most all had these things in common. I think, you know, that definitely was not year one, two, three, or four. Um, <laughs> year five is when I really started to bring that messaging forward in how I marketed um, or talked about the process, you know, whether it was the way I wrote a blog post or the way I did a video. Um, and also re realizing when I'm doing those inquiry or onboarding interviews or calls with clients, I'm saying, I've, I've paid attention. I'm saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. And they're generally, if they're the right client, saying the same back, same mm -hmm. thing back to me. So I would say in the last two years, that really crystallized for me to the point where when I revamped my website last year, that was, I knew I wanted to, to tell the story from their vantage point, not mine. Mm -hmm. So not what I as the hero can do for them, but what they <laughs> as the hero need in a guide to get them to where they want to go. I think that's so important. I think so many of us put our lens of like, here's what I want you to know about my thing or me or whatever. And so much of this is about saying, no, I'm here for you. Right. Right. I want to, I'm going to, we're going to come back to that, but Amy, I wanted to tap into your messaging a little bit. You've positioned your site around helping clients build their forever homes, mm -hmm. which is such a magical, powerful idea. How did you land on that as the central mission of your firm? Well, I think it had to do a lot with my own background and my own approach to wanting to have a place to stay put. You know, so much of what we see from design bloggers and designers is they're always kind of tackling that next house, that next oh, the flipping project. kind of thing, like yeah. that cycling like through. Flipping. Like they'll stay for five or seven years, mm -hmm. make this gorgeous place, and then they leave. Mm -hmm. And, you know, different strokes for different folks. And part of me is like, you work so hard. <laughs> You put your heart and soul into it. And I came from a background, I grew up in Southern New England, not the New York corridor, like definitely in the heart of Yankeeville. Just a minute, kid, <laughs> not now, sweetheart, in, in 15 minutes, okay? So <laughs> we got you. <laughs> you're missing your Zoom call. You're going to have to round back to it. Sorry. I can't. Okay. <laughs> Distance learning, the life, right? We got you. <laughs> Totally get it. <laughs> um, so basically, I we, my parents were Midwesterners coming to Connecticut, and everything was about value. It was very much about um, use it up, wear it out, fix it up, or do without. Mm -hmm. And so, 
they saw that they didn't want to go just go cheap, but they wanted good value and stuff that was going to stand the test of time. They didn't want to put money into a sofa that they were going to throw into a landfill in five years mm -hmm. and then have to buy it all over again. And so when I came into the interior design world and I approached this thing of like, we want to stay put, we want to build, we want to have this single house that our mm -hmm. kids make their memories in. How can I furnish it with the same quality and character that I don't have to redo in 10 mm -hmm. or 20 years? I just want to live in it and enjoy it and have my money invested well. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, surely there have got to be other people like me <laughs> who want to build just a single home mm -hmm. and who want it to be beautiful in what they want and they don't want to be constantly redoing it. But so many people, I feel like in our generation of late Gen Xers and millennials, we don't go furniture shopping. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't go to stores. In New Hampshire, we have no stores. <laughs> and we're 80 miles from Boston. And so we're so used to buying from whatever catalogs come to our mm -hmm. door. Mm -hmm. And so, so many people that I ran into in my consults and in mm -hmm. talking to people, they wanted something better, but they had no idea how mm -hmm. to get it or where to get it. And since I've been so house obsessed for so long and was the child of a furniture maker, I mean, I was always reading the back indices of magazines mm -hmm. and figuring out the different brands and where was American made and what was going to last. Mm -hmm. And so I figured I have to introduce this section of a generation to this mm -hmm. idea that what you do can last. Mm -hmm. You can feel at home in your forever home you don't have to constantly be tossing out furniture and not having things that work. We can make this work for you for the next 10 or 20 years, the lifetime of your family's time in your home. Mm -hmm. And it's really resonated. And I think people come to me now since I changed that messaging or since I solidified and crystallized that messaging. They trust me that I am going to try to spend their money very wisely mm -hmm. and that I'm going to counsel them. And that when I say, this is a good spend, this will give you the style that you're looking for, or this will give you the quality that you're looking for and we'll balance it somewhere else. I don't get pushback on mm -hmm. that anymore. And I wanted those clients that would trust me mm -hmm. and who would not be constantly shopping me or looking for extra ways to save money because I'm already doing that for you. Yeah. I know how hard you worked for your money, but I also know how you want to live and I know how you want to feel at home. So I wanted clients who were going to trust me that I was working for their vision and their value mm -hmm. over the long haul. Yeah. Who in, you know, when you define that ideal client, then who is that? For me, that client is usually in their mid thirties to mm -hmm. mid fifties. And some mm -hmm. of these people are, uh, some of my clients are soon to be empty nesters and they're finally kind of getting to do things the way they want to do. Mm -hmm. Some are younger families who are ready to get rid of the mishmash. They're tired of the marshals and the hand-me-downs, but they have no idea where to start. But it really is those, that client that is a professional um, that um, makes a comfortable salary, but mm -hmm. still has to be very thoughtful about how they invest it. Mm -hmm. I love that. I feel like there are two things kind of zooming out at play here. And one is the actual services that you offer. And then the second piece is how you talk about them. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to start because I think there is sort of a thoughtfulness that goes into what those design packages are that are right for this ideal client. Can you guys talk a little bit about kind of what you offer and how you divided up those different services and then how you really package them on your site? Um, do you want me to start? Yeah, go for it. Okay. So for me, um, we figured out pretty quickly that um, there are pr pretty much three ways we can help people. We help mm -hmm. them with a the consultation, we help them with the concept, or we help them with completion. Mm -hmm. And we, we try doing everything in between and we realize everybody kind of shakes out in one of those three buckets. Mm -hmm. um, but everyone needs, we need the time to explore. Mm -hmm. And so everyone for us starts with a consultation, everyone, no matter whether you know you wanna wind up at full service or you're not quite sure, you may just need the design concept. So for us, everyone starts with a two hour consultation and that gives us the time to really give them value Mm -hmm. and learn about them. Um, we don't do a free consultation, so I don't have to hold anything back or like, you know, kind of like nod my head and sit on my hands going, oh, I wish I could tell you this. And like, no, it's a it's a, a paid meeting, but that way we can give all of our value for two hours. Mm -hmm. And I tell people, if that's all you need, 
If you walk away and say, this was perfect. You answered all of my questions. I'm armed to figure this out myself from there, kind of. <laughs> yeah. If that gave you the confidence, that's mm -hmm. my, my, my promise, right? If, if that two-hour meeting gave you the confidence to take the next step, that's great. Um, and, and for some people, uh, I would say not a lot of people because our ideal client doesn't have the time, mm -hmm. does need us you know, to kind of guide them through. But for some people who don't really understand what they need yet, it's been perfect for us to be able to say, here's a nice, small barrier, low barrier of entry, mm -hmm. you know, to our consult, you get to know us, we get to know you, we can, you know, answer a few of your questions. Most times in that consult, you realize you have more questions or, <laughs> hey, it's not just the paint color. It's like, oh, wait, I have to figure some other things out before I can get to that question. But that is where we start uh, with, with everyone. Mm -hmm. And from that meeting, that gives us a really clear understanding of the scope and whether or not the next step for you is just to get you the concept, which some people who feel like I really enjoy the decorating, I just don't know, like, can you give me a paint by numbers? We can do that for you. Um, and that way, when you are making a purchase, uh, you have the confidence to make the right one because you know how it fits into the big scheme of things. Mm -hmm. And most of our clients wind up in the third bucket, which is full service, because when we show them the concept, they go, I could never do that. Like, <laughs> I need you to do it. So, but, but we've earned their trust. So we didn't mm -hmm. say from day one, like we want all in, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's a big jump for some people um, to understand the value that we're asking them to invest in the design piece. You yeah. know, some people look at their budget and they go, well, if I give you that much, you know, what am What's I going to spend on the stuff? <laughs> right. But if we can get you through that funnel, then by the time we, give you the proposal for full service, you understand all of the value that comes through that. You understand how we're gonna hold your hands through the process, how we're going to take the guesswork out of it, how we're going to get really, you know, the best bang for the buck when we are in that install phase and we're the ones taking the phone calls about what broke and what wasn't right. And what, you know, and you're just like happily enjoying a cup of coffee while we deal with the, you know, the messes. Um, when we get them to that proposal, they understand the value so much more. So that's how we've broken up our packages and it works really well for us. Clients can enter and, and stop at whatever point is appropriate for them without us feeling like we have to be like pushy salespeople that, you know, selling you something you don't want, but mm -hmm. they can also make an educated um, decision on where they stop because we can kind of uh, show them the expectations of what they'll get from each of those three buckets. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I know, Amy, you kind of have a, you have a three-part system too, but it's a little bit different. Can you walk us through it? Sure, sure. It's actually incredibly similar on the face mm -hmm. of it. Um, we do two-hour consults in person. Mm -hmm. um, some of them are standalone, though not many of them, frankly, mm -hmm. because people <laughs> find out that they just, they need more than just pointing in the right direction. I do design master plans, which mm -hmm. are um, kind of like your proposal, Ariana. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, where they have the whole thing, floor plans laid out, fabric samples, mm -hmm. a URL list that they can order from. I do offer if they um, to get custom upholstery mm -hmm. for them, if they do a one-time purchase and I can do the receiving warehouse, et cetera, et cetera. Because I find that so many, um, so many can, can homeowners don't know where to get upholstery and yeah. they might want something better quality than big box quality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. but it has to be done at once. Most people fall into the full service bucket and it's because they're so busy yeah. and they are contacting me in the first place because they're overwhelmed and they don't want to learn all the nuts and bolts. <laughs> they don't. It's just like, you know what? I go to stitch fix for my clothes because I don't know how to shop for clothes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I don't want to learn how. Um, I did just start a new service, mm -hmm. which is um, I launched to a founding members group, um, a DIY course for your forever home. And this is not to like paint all your furniture yourself. This is how to put together a design, a, a room with a designer's eye mm -hmm. to quality, comfort and style that will last the test of time, um, walking people through that. And that offering is really for, so I have a blog. I've been blogging for four and a half years every Saturday and I get over 30,000 hits a month. Mm -hmm. And so, and most of my blog readers, most of them are trying to do it on their own. Yeah. And I never really had a service for those ones who really want to learn how to do it. They enjoy it. They mm -hmm. might have to do it for financial reasons, but they enjoy it. They want to learn the nuts and bolts. And that's what this class is for. Mm -hmm. So that is more my DIY aspect for those mm -hmm. people.
but for most people it's consult. I get a few master plans now and then and the rest of it's full service. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is the master plan is that it's that that's the roadmap, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And kind of helping people who can maybe spread that out. That's right. Over, it's for, over yeah. time. It's for people who might need to make purchases over time. They're not ready to write a $35,000 check mm -hmm. to furnish their living room. They have to take advantage of sales or they might buy their upholstery through me. And that's mm -hmm. the first step, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and then they'll get their bookcases with the Christmas bonus or something like that. So mm -hmm. they have to do it over more time. Mm -hmm. right. I say at the, at the core of this conversation, you know, we've talked about value, but is it more helpful to look at that big picture of like how the design will change their life? Or is it about solving a specific design problem? Where, where do you kind of net out on kind of that, uh, like sliding scale, I guess. I, do you want to go Amy? Oh, um, sure. <laughs> I think for the most part, it's, it's really selling the big picture. Mm -hmm. You know, most people can see, especially once we do the consult, mm -hmm. that their specific problem that they think is a one is, is just one piece of a huge puzzle that's not working. Mm -hmm. And so what you, we sell is, can you imagine going from room to room and everything working for you and everything feeling like you, feeling like your second mm -hmm. skin? Mm -hmm. And it's that aspect of being at home, the whole big picture. Mm -hmm. Most people realize that I think at this point, once we do the consult that a certain paint color or just figuring out a certain set of built-ins is not Isn't it like the magic solution. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would definitely agree. And I think the key to this conversation is realizing that your clients are focused on the symptoms or your potential mm -hmm. clients. So when you speak to them about the big picture, you almost have to start at the symptom and then zoom them out and say, but that is just one little piece of the big picture, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what happens during the consult. That's what happens through, during the inquiry call. You know, even in the two hour call, I always have my, um, or two hour meeting. I always start the meeting with clients establishing their three priorities. You tell me what's the three most important things you want us to, to tackle today, right? And I will help guide you if I feel like you're off, right? So let's, let, let me get you, what's your first shot? So they'll give me three. They'll say, I want my paint color for my study. I need to, you know, figure out what's going to be, you know, the sofa in the living room. And then um, I need to look at my kitchen and see if there's anything I can do to refresh it. Those are things I made up. And so I'm like, okay, that's interesting. Tell me more. Well, we talked through it and I realized, okay, the paint color, that's a symptom of you feeling like your house doesn't feel cohesive and you think paint is the way to fix it. That might not be the case. The sofa, what are we doing? Are we buying a new sofa? Are we keeping the sofa? You don't know yet. Like when you really start to talk about those symptoms and ask them those questions again and then back them out, they realize actually, no, you're right. I need to really just be thoughtful about the entire design mm -hmm. of that room mm -hmm. and understand how the pink color is one tool in that room. The sofa is one tool in that <laughs> room. And so don't miss you know, the, some of the pitfalls that we fall into as designers when we communicate is we talk so much about the big picture. Mm -hmm. We talk so much about the big before and after that if a client really, really doesn't understand that their symptom is not really like all there is, Problem. they're going to miss it, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it's a, I heard this analogy once from a, um, either I read it in a business book or something, but a coach was saying, you know, if you have a headache, Tylenol says, I have a cure for a headache, the big picture, but the symptom uh, or the, uh, and the headache is the symptom, but the actual cause is maybe dehydration. Mm. Tylenol doesn't sell a medicine that says, here's dehydration. Cause you walk in and you don't think that's your issue. You're like, I just have a headache. Tell me how to fix the headache. Right? <laughs> so when you're talking about your value, mm -hmm. acknowledge the symptom mm -hmm. and then pull out of it that that is just one symptom of what actually is happening under the surface or what the big overall problem is. And that's really where our value is because if it's really just the paint color, you can get that anywhere. You can go to the paint store. They'll give you lots of recommendations. On the paint <laughs> you can read a ton of blog posts. You can. So really, if we stay there, we devalue what we bring. We, right. you know, we don't, we are not living up to that hourly rate that we're charging you if all we can do is give you a couple paint colors, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's as the designer piece, we have to think about how to push that conversation beyond that initial symptom so that we continue to build value into our industry and to mm -hmm. ourselves as service providers. I think one thing that I had read a long time ago and really struck with me as I was starting to do offerings is you have to start with what they think they need yes. and then finish up and guide them to what you know they need. 
That's but right. if you start with what you know they need, you're going to lose them and they're going to go somewhere else. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. How does talking about the budget fit into the broader conversation about value? Because there's there's what you need and then there's what you can pay for right now. And there's what you want to spend eventually. There's what you think it should cost versus what it actually costs. You know, all of how do you get all of those pieces to line up? So I used to, that's the biggest deer in headlights question I've always gotten, <laughs> which is like, hey, tell me your budget. And they go, and then it's this whole like, let me not show you all my cards. Well, maybe like, what if I gave you this much? You know, and so um, one of my one of my offerings for my blog was a budget builder because that was like the number one question, right? So I was like, here's my freebie. Here's my, my uh, opt-in tool. Here's mm -hmm. a, a spreadsheet. Just add the numbers up. People still don't want to do that because they're just afraid of, that number. And so now the conversation that I have with clients, especially in when we're talking about design concept and full service is, okay, we can do this one of two ways. We can, you can tell me your budget, how much you have today, and I will design to that. But that doesn't mean that's going to be the best design. Mm -hmm. Or I can tell you what it's going to take to get you what you say you need mm -hmm. to solve the problems. And then you can look at that and you can say, oh, well, now I can either calibrate my expectations. Mm -hmm. Like if you went into a car dealership and wanted the fully loaded and then realized that by the sticker shock, you might need just like the standard, <laughs> or you could phase that in. And I can show you how to phase it in without sacrificing the integrity of the design. Mm -hmm. And I find that that's a much more productive conversation. People kind of breathe mm -hmm. and go, okay, oh, okay. So I don't have to have, like she said, the $35,000 check today. Mm -hmm. I can actually help, you know, design this space and know what I need and then phase it in mm -hmm. with your help and guidance to know how to keep that confidence as I'm mm -hmm. making those purchases that it's all going to work out in the end. Well, and how much of that, you know, that, that kind of deer in headlights look of like, what's your budget? And the client's like, I have no idea. How much of that is that they don't want to tell you versus that they have no idea what it should cost? Um, for most of my clients, they have no idea what it should cost. Again, it. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, most of the people I'm working with, this is the first time they've worked with a designer. Mm -hmm. This is a really mm -hmm. like, this is like a step out of their comfort zone yes. because their husbands or their significant others really think that they could have done it themselves. Bing. And all the, bing, bing, bing. <laughs> yeah, all the mistakes are starting to add up, <laughs> you know? So Can I will save you time, like, money, yes. and your marriage yeah, yeah, yeah. in there. <laughs> yes. That's what's so, happening. <laughs> my freebie I developed, honestly, it's not a sexy freebie. It's called Realistic Decorating Budgets for Your Forever Home. See? But I also developed it as a tool for me to use with my clients. Mm -hmm. And it takes like the top three decorating rooms, not renovations, just decorating. Yeah. Master bedroom, dining room, and living room. And it gives a high-end, a mid-range, and a value-based budget. Yeah. With the value-based budget being like the minimum I feel that you can spend to get something that is going to give you the quality, comfort, and style that's going to last the test of time. Yeah. However, it's not going to give you customization options or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So when I'm talking to clients about their budgets, I say, download my budget. Mm -hmm. okay, then we're going to talk. Then they'll come back to me with what they want to do. And they'll come back to me with a budget. And so I'll say, look, I'm going to give you a plan according to your budget. Mm -hmm. And then I'm also going to develop one with some bells and whistles. Mm -hmm. which might be the ex like more of what they want so they can see what it actually costs to get those built-ins as opposed mm -hmm. to just a couple of bookshelves or if you do want those gorgeous window treatments in the 150 dollars a yard fabric <laughs> yeah. this is what it's going to do for your room it's going to mm -hmm. be amazing right but this is what it's going to cost you you can choose the value option or you can choose the bells and whistles mm -hmm. but at least i've given them what they want mm -hmm. they still have a realistic budget yeah. It may not be the pop they want, but then mm -hmm. usually when they see the pop, they, they kind of find them. a way. <laughs> yeah, they do. The, the money just comes like manna from heaven when they see the vision. <laughs> One of the things that I learned from a friend of mine, uh, who's a designer, um, she does a variation on this, but I thought it was brilliant, was I do think it's for, for the ideal client that she and I both are, are describing, it's that they don't know more so than they're kind of holding their cards right. um, and they don't want to make a mistake and they want to, they want to spend when it's right. And they, you know, don't want to overspend. So they just don't know how it should all shake out. Um, and one of the things that I learned from her that I thought was brilliant that I started taking into my consultations was when I'm going into a consultation and it's pretty likely that we're going to be writing a proposal for the full service or even the design concept. Mm -hmm. I have a redacted case study. So if it's a master bedroom, mm -hmm. here's a master bedroom we did, mm -hmm. taking out names and addresses. Here's right. about what it cost. 
So you can, if you love that, uh, that part of my portfolio, this is an idea of what it took financially to get there. And that doesn't require spec work, right? It doesn't require <laughs> me building out, you know, the proposal for them, but it's so helpful for them to say, oh, okay, if you had told me that it would cost $50,000 to redo my master bedroom, I would have looked at you crazy. But when I see your portfolio and see how you've told me, okay, well, the bed, the built-in cost this, the da, 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 I now see how all so those things items are asked as well. Yeah, yeah, okay. itemized. So the only thing that's not included is any personal information about the client. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a project we already did. It's a case study we can pull together in the office. We have one for each type of room. So if we're going to a kitchen renovation, here's a case study on a kitchen. Here's a living room. Here's, and so we don't have to do any new work on giving that client who's struggling with the budget piece an idea of how much a kitchen or a bedroom or a bathroom mm -hmm. could cost, mm -hmm. you know, and we've got the the portfolio pictures to tie back. So again, to me, it's, it's a, a really smart way of um, I love getting that. over that hump. If people are really, really, really struggling with that budget number and showing them an actual project that you mm -hmm. executed so that you can talk to them about where their cost drivers were and where, you know, we did these really cool things in this project that maybe you don't need. And so let's talk about how that can maybe bring the price range or the cost down for your type of project. Right. That's really interesting. That's a great tool. Mm -hmm. As you, you know, some of this is really kind of big picture thinking, but how does thinking about value come up in your day-to-day -day work and how, you know, how do you feel that in sort of the, the grindy, like executing parts of this, job and you know is that still kind of an ever-present thing that you're thinking about I think it's it's definitely a core value mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> for us is it's so it's you know it's what Amy said earlier it's really making sure the client understands they can trust us to be a good steward with their finances mm -hmm. I'm not going to spend money frivolously I'm going to be thoughtful about where we invest money. I'm going to mix high and low. I'm going to show you how to, you know, get again, the best value for whatever category that is, uh, that you don't have to, you know, rebuy later, or that's not just going to be pretty and not functional. <laughs> um, and so to me, it's all, it's in every part of what we do. It's mm -hmm. down to, you know, how we design the space. Okay. Are we really being thoughtful about the square footage given to us and mm -hmm. using every area to get the best, the best value out of that client's living space. Mm -hmm. Then when we design it and we do our trade day and walkthrough, we're talking to our trades and we're saying, okay, this is our vision, but is there a better <laughs> way to do this? Like, is there a more cost-effective way to do this? Is, is this going to be a cost driver and really working with them to make sure that when we come back to the client and we give them their bids, we can say, you know, Hey, this wasn't the cheapest bid. Mm -hmm. But on value, on quality, on execution, it's the best bet for you. Mm -hmm. um, so it's in every part of our dialogue with our client is, is re just beating that drum. Of we are bringing you immense value. We are mm -hmm. making this so much more valuable that when you, at the end of this, look back, you will have you know, said, I would write that check over and over and over again mm -hmm. every day because it was worth every penny because of what I got for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that trust factor is huge. Mm -hmm. Just knowing that, just knowing how you would spend money in your own home mm -hmm. and, and communicating that to them and knowing how, and, and just saying over and over again, I am doing the best that I can for you with all the wealth of information I have. I use good people whose work I trust. How many tradespeople have you been unhappy with their work or they don't show <laughs> up or things like that? Yeah. Sometimes it's worth spending the extra money to get this person because they are going to do the job you want. It, yeah, trust is absolutely enormous. What's the first step? If you know, when you, when you look back at where, when you began to really crystallize these ideas and kind of fold them into your business for other designers who want to really take this approach, how do you start looking inwards to figure out what that means for you? I think you need to look to your own story so mm -hmm. often and that's that's how you're being authentic that's how you're being genuine and that is your true value it's what your unique background has brought to this and i think it's okay to be specific mm -hmm. and then and that's how you're going to find you're not going to we'll put it this way yes you are going to call your your <laughs> ideal client you're not going to be getting called from everyone anymore but that could be a really good thing yeah. because yeah. people are going to be coming to you with the mindset that is approachable and that you want to work with mm -hmm. and they're going to be willing to invest in the ideals and whatnot that you bring mm -hmm. to the table yeah. so if you're being very genuine to mm -hmm. your own experience 
that's the best way to be able to attract your ideal client. Mm -hmm. It has to be like a really scary, I'm sorry. There has to be a really scary moment though, where you say, okay, I'm not going to get a lot of calls because (laughs) I've been so specific. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, but I embrace it because Mm -hmm. I, you know, I think there's a, well, at least for me in my business, there was that, that kind of upward climb of the roller coaster where you're like, I, anybody like just, if you trust me, if you believe in me, I can do it. I promise. <laughs> you're like, please, anyone, I don't care what it is. You know, you do all those projects and you're like, oh, okay, I guess this is paying the dues part. And then you kind of get to the top where you have almost too much work, or at least my experience was you have too many people who, you know, want your help or projects. So then you have a choice. You're like, do I scale to be able to support everyone. And right. now that's taking on more responsibility. You know, now I'm not a lean, mean operating machine. I've got overhead right. costs, I've got staff, right? Or do I say, okay, at this point, I need to make a decision and say, okay, I might eventually scale, but it's because I wanna be able to take on more of the right kinds of projects. And we might not do 20 projects a year, we might do three, but if they're three really good projects and it takes a team of four to do that, really well, that's a different conversation. And that is what has happened for, for me is going from that uh, feast or famine feeling mm-hmm. to realizing I'd rather have, you know, those lulls to recuperate from really big fulfilling projects mm-hmm. than every day be waking up feeling like I'm just, you know, being pulled in a million directions. And in a lot of cases, being pulled in a lot of directions by clients that aren't my ideal. So I'm not making them happy and they're not making me happy. And it's just a constant feeling of struggle and angst. Mm -hmm. Um, And and when you look at it that way, it's not as scary to say, (laughs) people aren't calling me. Yes. You know, my (laughs) website, I say, all, and I think I told you this on the interview, my Mm -hmm. website does two things. It either repels or attracts. Mm -hmm. I am so happy if it repelled you in a way that didn't make you feel bad, but made you say, Mm, she's not the one for me. That's a mm-hmm. phone call I didn't have to take. That's an inquiry meeting I didn't have mm-hmm. to spend 15 minutes or 30 minutes on. You know, that saved me time. Mm-hmm. And it created the space for my ideal client that I'm constantly attracting because I'm speaking directly to them. And if mm-hmm. you think about it that way, it takes that fear out of, mm-hmm. you know, narrowing down your focus. Mm-hmm. And like Amy said, most times your ideal client is a lot like you, either where you were or they have something in common with your core values and how you approach design. Um, my language about save time, save money, save, marriage, save marriages is because I live in Louisiana, which is an oil and gas state. Most of my clients are married to people in the oil and gas industry, likely engineers. I'm married to an engineer. So when I talk about how analytical, by the books, Excel, pro, Excel spreadsheet, <laughs> detailed, uh, when I when I can tell my clients, I understand exactly what your husband is going to ask you. I know exactly what you need to say to make him hear and understand you. It's because that's my existence. If I can get my husband to understand, you can get yours too. Or I can be that liaison for you because I know that type of mindset. And I know when you say those three things, those are their biggest concerns. Mm -hmm. How much is it going to cost? How long is this going to take? And are we going to fight about this every day? If you can tell them those are going to be off the table, they are going to be more likely to come to the the process open and and willing to to at least give it a shot. Mm -hmm. I think one thing that you said to the website that attracts or repels, Mm -hmm. and it is a little frightening because I live up in New Hampshire this is not, and I live above Manchester, so we're not commuting distance from Boston. This is not a, an incredibly affluent area. So mm-hmm. my client potential base is already pretty small yeah. <laughs> if we're taking out the vacation homers, you know? But the thing is, is when you are repelling certain people, um, think back to those early projects that you took on just because you're trying to get your feet wet. Think about the ones that were incredibly dissatisfying the ones where you felt like you were fighting tooth and nail almost that like you were constantly being questioned or almost attacked were those your ideal clients do you want them really calling you was the money worth it you probably didn't make much money at the end of the day because you couldn't bill for all the time right (laughs) Right. (laughs) so in repelling those people you're creating more of the business that you really want Mm -hmm. and you're also inviting in people who may not have called you before because they didn't have really identified with you. I found that over the last year and a half after really solidifying my messaging, that my projects have gotten so much better. And it's not because my portfolio has gotten better. It's just because people come to me ready 
all mm -hmm. with the mindset and the mm -hmm. ideals of what they want to accomplish. Yeah. So not only is that more satisfying for me, mm -hmm. but I can achieve better results for them at the end of the day and make more money at it. Mm -hmm. That's it every day. And also realize those you're repelling because they're not the right client. You know, every client, because I believe all of us are going to bring our highest uh, level to each project, right? We're going to always try to do our very best. Mm -hmm. Every client is a referral source, whether they're a good client or a bad client. Mm -hmm. And if you push through, as you will do with all those clients that aren't really your ideal, mm -hmm. they're going to refer you and bring more clients like them because they're going to talk. They're going to say, how much is she charging? What does she do? And oh, she took your phone call at 3 a.m. every morning. Oh yeah, that's what I want. And so <laughs> when you repel, you're repelling not only that client, but their entire the referral network. source. Okay? <laughs> well, I didn't think about repelling the network. It is. It's so true because that is the cycle. You know, if you think about when you're starting, you are in that cycle of being referred to other people. Mm -hmm. I have not spent a whole lot of money advertising. I've mm -hmm. always had good referrals sources good and bad right so when I find a client that isn't my ideal they are so happy with me because I pushed through it they don't realize I've got ulcers headaches <laughs> migraines by the end of it they're just happy that it's done their house looks beautiful and then they're telling friends and I'm like oh please 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 I say and like their lens of where the value was doesn't match up probably with what was important absolutely. to you absolutely absolutely so so that should give you some comfort too when you're thinking about repelling mm -hmm. not just repelling those clients that aren't ideal, but their entire, you know, group of friends and family who would, they would be referring you to, mm -hmm. to keep your pipeline full and to uh, take away space from those ideal clients who could be on your plate. And attracting have, people that are really, that may not have been attracted to you before. That's mm -hmm. right. That's right. We have an amazing question from Allegra. How do you discuss hidden or unexpected project fees? How do you set client expectations? And do you spell that out beforehand? So when we, when I have the two hour consult, mm -hmm. which is either standalone or is necessary to begin a potential full service mm -hmm. design, the last 20 minutes or so is spent going through the contract. Mm -hmm. Like we go through it line by line. And, and, <laughs> and how the, long is your contract? Just curious. Gosh, I, I haven't looked at, it. I don't know, four or five pages. Okay. Something like they, you know, I feel like they vary. Like some, yeah, yeah. Some people are like, mine's one page. Other people are like, it's a 50 page document. You know, so. my, mine is, um, it's like, four pages of explaining the proposal because I'm mm -hmm. very detailed in the scope and kind of like telling them their story again and what in the imagining and all those mm -hmm. things. But then the standard terms and agreement is about mm -hmm. four pages, like she says, and it goes over everything from, you know, purchasing uh, furniture to if you use, you know, decide to use your trades and not our trades, uh, all of that we kind of mm -hmm. go through uh, in, in the contract. And we go through, um, since lots of people aren't used to paying freight and warehousing, mm -hmm. that is a huge part of the explanation in, in talking. When we get to that line item, I tell them everything that goes into it. And that's like, this may be something that you're not used to seeing. You mm -hmm. may pay $250 from Pottery Barn yeah. for white glove delivery. But what that entails is it actually going to a warehouse, yes. someone physically unwrapping it, yeah. checking it all, Yep. wrapping it back up to you, bringing it to you and disposing of all the cartage. Yep. <laughs> and so when they see that and see that I usually tag on a certain percentage saying, this is my estimate, then they see the value in it, yep. um, in, the, in the freight and the shipping and the, um, the warehousing. I also, the upfront of the contract is um, just the whole process, mm -hmm. laying it out sort of like step-by-step step and an estimate of how long certain parts of it could take. Mm -hmm. um, just so people are not surprised that this could be a six month process. Mm -hmm. um, if you're doing multiple rooms and it's a staged thing, it could be a year, mm -hmm. you know, um, because you want to have that ahead of time in COVID. Now I have been super, super um, safe in my shipping and um, availability things because I don't know, Ariana, you, I'm sure you've yes. determined it. Like the wait, the lead times are crazy, crazy it's, long. It's and, crazy freight long. Dam and freight damage has been awful. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, and that's adding on weeks and weeks. Yep. And all I can say is this is, unex this is completely unprecedented. Yeah. We will get your project finished. <laughs> it will come in in one piece, but you have to bear with us because everyone's trying to do their best. Yeah. So prepare for the worst <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then they won't, they won't be upset as much when stuff right. like that happens. Right. Right. No, I, I, this COVID period is just a whole there's the good of everybody's in it, right? <laughs> and then the bad of just, you don't know how to explain to someone, sorry, the sun is coming in, 
my life force. <laughs> um, how to explain to someone what to expect because you don't know. Um, so timelines have definitely been a thing we have to talk about over and over and over again during the process and just remind people that we're in an unprecedented period of time with how to, to schedule and forecast when we can do installs. Um, as far as the hidden costs, uh, we go over some of the places that hidden costs typically pop up. Mm -hmm. um, this is also something that we can use uh, in our case study examples where we say, hey, this client's budget was this much. Mm -hmm. This is how much they actually spent. And here are what here were some of the cost drivers. Here are some of the things we did not anticipate or that, you know, we kind of changed the scope when we realized we needed to do something different to get to achieve it. And I think when you talk to, to clients about the actual process and your actual value, the fact that you are um, the resource for the contractor or the trade to make those decisions and, and, and be there to make solutions that don't stop the train. Right. If you continue to talk about your value, I, I tell my clients all the time, you're, you're going to love me in the console because it's mm -hmm. fun. You love me in the design concept, you know, when we're presenting because it's the dream and it's the, oh, you know, it's all great. And that's got to hold you like that's, that's the potential. Appetizer. Yeah, <laughs> it's got to hold you. That's got to hold you through the hard I stuff. I promise you <laughs> where I'm actually earning my value is what you don't see. It's when you say, let's do it. And I start with my team to procure uh, uh, furniture pieces. And we go in and we say, these are the things we want it. And then we have to go back and say, these are the lead times. And, then, and we're shuffling things around. And then when things are arriving and they're not, you know, they're damaged, we're, just back. we're making sure all of that's happening. When people are at your house doing construction, we're actually checking in to make sure the work is done. We're getting the call that says, hey, we opened up the wall and this is what we found. What do you want to do? And so it's all of those moments that you don't see I always tell them it's kind of like when you watch Avengers or you watch like a Marvel movie, the world does not realize how many times we almost got blown off the planet. Like we don't know. We're just <laughs> going about our day. But the Avengers know and we are your Avengers, okay? <laughs> so when you say that they laugh, but it, it, it primes them, right? And they're like, okay, well do your thing. Like, all right, so this is this is it. The fact that I don't have to take those- I'm gonna things. use that, that's great. Yeah, it's true though, <laughs> think about it, it's so true. The Avengers know. How many times we almost didn't make it. But if you watch the movie and see the people drinking coffee in the coffee shops or walking to their job, they have no clue. Yeah, that's right. you. <laughs> Client, that's you. That's why you got us. And and so we earn. And, and when you say that, it takes the pressure off you as a designer to be perfect mm -hmm. because no project's perfect. Every project has something that comes up, you know, in the process. So it takes the pressure off you because you can position it as your value. But then for them, they're expecting it. So if you have a flawless project, but if you don't, they expect it. They know it's coming and they know you're going to handle it. You're going to take care of it if they just trust you to do your job. So that's how we handle our kind of hidden costs. Um, the last piece I would ask to add to that is just a contingency, you know, so that we can really pivot when we need to without wasting time. So we tell clients we're building in a contingency because if we need to make a change, I don't want to have to run behind you and waste a week asking you, is it okay if we spend $300 more on this or, you know, this extra thing is going to cost $1,500? Like, just give us the contingency, know that we're going to keep the design intention whole. And if we've got to use that money, we'll use it. How do you set that? Is that a percentage of the project budget or how do you figure out what the right amount for that is? We do a percentage of the project budget, mm -hmm. which helps us tremendously to continue to move projects. Yeah, And then it's like a little, you know, bonus to them. If we don't use it, here's, we don't keep it. So, you know, here's your money <laughs> back. <laughs> we can, if you like. That's great. <laughs> what, we have a great question from Anna. She asked, uh, what are the primary mediums that you use to communicate your messaging about what repels and attracts? And I know I asked you a lot about your websites, but let's also talk a little bit about social or kind of where else does that messaging pop up? Mine's on my website and my blog. Like I said, I blog almost every Saturday. Um, and that's where I've, I've put the majority of my focus. Mm -hmm. I know that other mediums have um, popped up over the mm -hmm. years, but I'm one woman and I can only do one thing. Mm -hmm. And I know all the stuff. I know all the stuff that you're supposed to do. Ariana, I spent eight years in PR before I said Yeah, so you know. But I think yeah. I think what you're doing is brilliant. I think that's you have established and you've done it really well. So many of us get attracted to all the shiny things and we feel like we have to be 50 million places. But I, I love that. I think that you're doing it absolutely correctly. And you've also figured out how to monetize that piece of it and to offer something to those people because most times your readers aren't necessarily your ideal client yet. 
Mm-hmm. Like they love you. They're your biggest fans. And so to have a product offering or service for them is, I think it's brilliant. For me, um, my website, I blog, but not as regularly as I used to because she's right. It's a full-time awesome. commitment and job. Yeah. Uh, um, if anyone um, can monetize my blog out there better, please call me because I don't have time to do it. Yeah, it's it's a job, you know. Um, I am on social, so a little bit of Facebook, mainly Instagram. I do a lot of videos, so also YouTube. But, you know, the content that I create, whether it's a caption on Instagram or a, a video, is always it's edu- it's entertaining, but if you really listen to it, it's always building value in our industry. It's always talking about not just like the pretty, but like all of the things that we have to think about and do to make that happen. And I, I, I always feel like my uh, content is a tool for us as a whole to continue to learn how to talk about why we matter and why we really are relevant. How, you know, it doesn't matter how much access you have to websites where you can order furniture what we offer is an actual value. It's an actual service that can improve your quality of life and your experience with your home. And so that's the the way I position my content and build value. Absolutely. Anna had a, sorry, Anna had a follow-up question. I think this is good for both of you. How important is your email list to communicate that message? Um, My email list is pretty important. Um, Mm -hmm. I found that it's funny being in such a small rural area that I am that the majority of my good clients signed up for my blog um, six months, nine months earlier. Mm -hmm. And so they were watching that weekly content coming out. They were looking through four years worth of additional content. And the one thing that um, my, you know, I I do post to Instagram here and there. I I need to make it better. But the one thing I love about being on the web is SEO. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I've got blog posts that have gone so viral that now, like I said, I've got like more than 30,000 hits on my website a month. And if anyone looks up New Hampshire designers, they're going to find me right away. We're a small pool, but you know, <laughs> you know yeah. but they're going to find me along with the major architect design firms, which if I didn't have that weekly content coming every single time and updating Google, I doubt people would find me as easily. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think for me, my email list has been um, instrumental in telling the story of design, telling the story about projects that can go beyond just the before and after portfolio picks. Mm -hmm. And also I find that, um, I don't know how to describe it, but most of my readers and email subscribers aren't ready for a full service high-end project yet. But because of the way I talk about it, there is no expectation. So I'm always worried about, you know, the people who who are following you and reading your blog and, um, you know, on your social media accounts, you know, they add value because they are part of your tribe. And, you know, when you look at opportunities for influencers and partnerships, that's value, the number of, you know, people you have and how engaged they are. But I never want them to feel like I have nothing for them. I never want them to feel like they're just a spectator. And so I find that because of the way I talk about design, they know that I'm not a, hey, can I call you for a paint color person? But they also aspire to work with me. And I've had people who have read my blog or followed me on social for years who get to the point where they're building a new house, who say to me, I have been really like saving for you for four years. Mm -hmm. That's the power of the email list. It's that continued relationship popping up, showing up in their inbox once a week, once a month, whatever, is continuing to keep Mm -hmm. you at the back of their mind so that when they're ready, they know you're the person to call. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, like I said, usually people sign up for my blog six to nine months before they ever call me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I have two things. Um, a couple people in Q and A and chat, were asking for both of your websites and business names. So I just put that in the chat. So Yay. if you want to catch up with Ariane or Amy, you can find them at their websites there. Someone also just followed up. What kind of things do you send to your subscribers? Is it, you know, is it the new blog posts and, and how often do you send emails? Um, I'm probably less frequent than Amy. <laughs> so I do um, once a month. I used to do once a week when I blogged regularly. Mm-hmm. Um, and it would be like, you know, kind of a, a teaser to the blog post. So I wasn't like, you know, creating new content. It was just like a teaser mm-hmm. to the blog post, yeah. maybe a call to action. Um, now it's more like a monthly newsletter. So it's like all the great things that have happened, the projects we're working on, you know, here's a couple of my last videos or Facebook last. So it's really just more of a curated. Um, like here's where summary. I've been. Yeah. yeah curated <laughs> summary of uh, what we've produced already. Mm-hmm. 
for them, you know, during that month. And that at least gives me something to keep bringing them to. And, and you'd be surprised, you know, I'll say in my, my email, Hey, you know, read whatever, whatever. And then at the end, I'll say, Hey, let me know what you thought about it. Or what are you thinking? Or what are you working on? And they will literally reply like, like, Hey, Ariane. Yeah. This weekend I'm going and like, that makes me so happy because that means that they feel like I'm actually talking to them. Mm -hmm. Um, and not just like sending them a form letter or something. Mm -hmm. So and for yeah. me, it's the blog posts. Mm -hmm. And so it is some of the previews of projects or the before and afters, things like that. Um, but a lot of it too, it's just everything that is on message for me. Yeah. It is stuff that I think is valuable to know if you're looking to design your forever home with the quality, comfort, and style that will last the test of time. Yeah. So I'm not going to be pedal. I'm sorry, Ikea is never going to call me and right. ask me to be an Ikea influencer. Right. I have Ikea in here. I actually do. But you know, <laughs> like the, I'm never going to be promoting a ton of their materials, but I will say in my posts, like if there's an item or two here and there that I think yeah. will mesh in with my ideals. Mm -hmm. right. And so it's continually, whatever I do, it's selling those ideals. Mm -hmm. um, if it's other designers that I see, if it is a really fabulous project, if it is um, resurrecting um, good, like br brown furniture is a big thing for me. You know, like mm -hmm. the reproduction furniture of the 70s and 80s, which you can buy for a couple of hundred bucks, like which was yeah. made by American artisans. Hell yeah, that is quality, comfort and style. It'll stand the test of time and you'll save some money too. So you can spend it on that great new sectional for, that is, you know, made in North Carolina today. Yeah. So everything I do on my blog, whether it's my work, analyzing other work or mm -hmm. giving notice of new things that are coming out, it is always on message. Mm -hmm. That's, awesome. That's great. I have one kind of really specific question from Lorraine. She said, how do you handle change orders in the middle of a project? Get mm -hmm. in writing. Yeah. <laughs> Keep them focused mm -hmm. on the deliverables we committed to. Mm -hmm. Acknowledge it. So yeah. I, you know, acknowledge that I heard the request. Mm -hmm. Keep them focused on what we agreed to in that timeline. And then ask, I always just say, hey, so would you like me to create a proposal for that as our phase two? Like mm -hmm. that's my segue. So then I can keep that because sometimes the client, when they see things happening, they get all excited. They're like, oh, we didn't touch this room. And what about this wall? And, and <laughs> they just, you know, want to do all the things um, while you're moving. But I, mm -hmm. I just like I tell them, you know, in order for us to get you comfortable enough to move forward on this, we have to show you the full plan. Mm -hmm. let's not do ourselves a disservice by adding this little thing in or throwing this thing, you know, in, in the last minute, let's actually be thoughtful about it. Start the process, go through what we know works. And then that would be our phase two for the project. I just do a scope of, a new, um, scope of work agreement, which mm -hmm. is usually like a one or two pager. Mm -hmm. And basically it outlines the new money that will be allocated to the okay. new project, what exactly will be entailed in that so that it, it doesn't keep going scope creep and they still think they're gonna get the same amount or yeah. get more for the same amount of money they already spent. Mm -hmm. And that scope of work agreement, which is different from the contract for me anyway, mm -hmm. which like I said, is like <laughs> usually like a one and a half to two pager. Mm -hmm. It outlines their budget and everything that I'm expected to do. It's probably more the proposal. Yeah. You yeah. Do. I just call it a scope of work agreement. And, um, so, and I tell them and make sure that I don't overdo what you want Right. And it makes sure that if you feel like I've like that, that you're getting what you want and that I understand the project correctly and mm -hmm. don't sign it. If I haven't understood the project correctly, <laughs> let's edit it. That's, you know? right. That's amazing. This has been so extraordinary. The two of you are incredible. Thank you to everyone who joined us today and for all of your great questions. I'm just, I'm going to spend the rest of the day. So, so inspired. So Ariane, Amy, thank you so much for joining us today. A huge thank you, thank you to Universal. Um, Universal is gonna be hosting a virtual market November 16th and 17th. So if you weren't in High Point and you haven't seen their new collections yet, I got a chance to see the new Coastal Living Outdoor Collection virtually via FaceTime a few days ago. You don't wanna miss it. So make sure you tune in November 16th and 17th to see what all the videos and virtual walkthroughs they've cooked up. Um, and again, just thank you everyone. It's so great to have this conversation today. Ariane, Amy, you guys are amazing. Thank, Thank you. you so much for having us. Yes, this has been a lot of fun. <laughs> Absolutely. It's been a lot of fun. Happy Monday, everyone. Yes. <laughs> Have You're a great tired. rest of the week. Yes. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. All right. Bye-bye.